Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today we will read an article by Peter Blake titled The Vanishing American House, published in 1957 on the first issue of the Italian magazine Zodiac. More than one million houses have been constructed in the United States almost every year since the end of World War II. By purely physical standards, most of them have been exceedingly well-built, exceedingly well-equipped, exceedingly comfortable. By any architectural standards, the vast majority of them has ranged from bad to terrible. By sociological standards, most of these houses have raised more problems and more serious problems than they have solved. But, apart from questions of quality, however defined, these millions of houses have demonstrated both the advantages and the drawbacks of mass production and mass consumption in a free enterprise society. With very few exceptions, these houses have been built by private capital, sometimes for individual owners, more often for a large, amorphous home-buying public. The builders, in the latter case, have been manufacturers of a product designed first for rapid and economical construction and secondly for quick sale. Many of these builders come into the home building industry from some other field of manufacturing. One of the best builders in America today used to bottle and sell milk until a very few years ago. Others were in the clothing business. Still others come into home building from the shipping and automobile industries. All of these men, the successful ones at least, are entrepreneurs whose product happens to be called house, but might just as easily be called button or icebox. The only difference is that the product house is harder to make because it has so many different parts and harder to sell because it is so expensive. But the basic attitude of the manufacturer remains substantially the same. Every year, a few houses are built in America for specific families, for a specific site and designed by a specific architect. These houses are the research laboratory of American home building. In them, new building techniques, new types of equipment, new ways of living are being tested every day by families who can afford to finance such tests and serve as guinea pigs. A growing percentage of these custom-built houses has turned out to be important architecture. Some have become famous for having achieved a major aesthetic advance at the right time. In fact, many of these advances were possible only in the field of house architecture, because here the equation was much simpler than in all other buildings. All that was needed was a good architect, of which America has many today thanks in part to the arrival of a large number of teachers in architecture in the 1930s, an adventurous client, and a relatively small amount of money to foot the bills. The products of such equations have steadily grown in number and in quality, so that, as of today, America can boost at least two equally important fields of home building, the quality field of architecture and the quantity field of housing. The degree to which these two fields are able to interact, complement and strengthen each other is a critical problem in the building of an American civilization. The problem has not been solved to date. In a free enterprise democracy it cannot be solved by flat. How will it ever be solved? The quantity field of American home building is one of the three biggest industries in the United States. Yet, it differs from automobile production, movie production or basic materials production in one essential respect. Its manufacturers are many rather than few, and the output of each is small. Even the biggest builder in the country produces only 1 or 2% of the total houses built each year in the United States. 
He is a dwarf compared with General Motors, whose production is more than 50% of all automobiles sold. What does this mean? It means two things primarily. First, it means that the housemaker is too small to engage in any effective research. And secondly, it means that he is too small to shape his public's taste through expensive educational or advertising campaigns. And so he desperately follows what he thinks is his public's taste, instead of leading it boldly as do some big manufacturers in other fields. Because this small housemaker has no funds for research, he cannot afford any real architectural services. And even if and when he can, those services are limited to finding better ways of packaging last year's model to make it sell faster in this year's market. And because this small housemaker has no funds for advertising or other forms of consumer education, he is forced, in a competitive society, to build his product house to satisfy the lowest common denominator of his potential buying public. Why, then, are there good reasons to hope for a renaissance in American domestic architecture? There is good reason for hope because of two factors that are beginning to shape the American house more decisively each year. First, there is the existence of an abundance of good young architects. And second, there is the inevitable development of new house production methods to meet rapidly growing needs during the immediate future. Most young architects in America, whether they like it or not, start out by designing a single house, for themselves, their parents, or for some courageous friends. These houses are, of course, built painstakingly by hand, specifically by the hands of carpenters and masons often unfamiliar with the new design idiom. Yet, in most cases, these individual, one-at-a-time houses are designed with an eye on potential mass production. Most of them are modular, most have a regular repetitive structural system, and most are based upon an aesthetic whose every detail was developed by men who believed in the inevitability of an industrialized architecture. We all know the earmarks of this style, the repetitive pattern of wall panels, of posts and beams, of windows and doors, is the sine qua non of all modern domestic architecture, including even the anti-regimentarian style of Wright. These patterns, with their implication of mass production and industrialization, are often achieved at great expense and with considerable difficulty. Yet, they form a discipline which modern American architects are extremely hesitant to abandon, a discipline without which they might well be lost. Still, regardless of whether or not this stylistic discipline makes practical sense at the moment, the fetish continues. It produces each year a more clear-cut set of standards. The 4-inch module is virtually the accepted tool of the home building industry. The standardized kitchen, all in one package, is now a mass production item. The standardized bath is just around the corner. Prefabricated storage walls to serve as flexible room dividers have been on the market for 10 years. All these items were first pioneered by architects building simple houses for individual clients and using the opportunity to further the cause of mass production of parts of houses and of assemblies of costly equipment. This process of voluntary freelance research, informal, uncoordinated but enormously enthusiastic, is continuing without let up. Light steel and aluminium, plastics, paper structures, fiberglass structures, etc., etc., are all being experimented with, not by big builders and not by big manufacturers, but by a dedicated group of small practice architects building little houses for their aunts and uncles, friends and neighbors. 
and every year the big builders and the big manufacturers pick and choose from this great wealth of uncoordinated effort. This process is not particularly rewarding for the architects themselves, although they are finding it easier each year to build good houses inexpensively from stock parts listed in many manufacturers' catalogues. It is, however, a rewarding process for the consumers of houses, for if the process continues at the present rate, it may soon be quite difficult for builders to put up a really bad house, however hard he may try. This brings us to our second reason for hope. In all likelihood, the need for new houses in America will increase to around 2 million a year by 1965. If this estimate holds up, then there will not be enough masons, carpenters, plumbers and electricians in America in 1965 to meet the demand. There will not be enough materials to meet the demand either, nor will there be enough land in the right places or for that matter enough money. There will not be enough of any of these services and commodities that is, unless the American home building industry starts going into house manufacture in earnest. Unless it industrializes its methods, conserves its materials and uses the available land intelligently. This fact is well known to economists in home building today, and it is sensed by architects who therefore feel that the average builder's preoccupation with uh, salesmanship, with packaging and with consumer surveys is uninteresting and besides the point. Still, even in a future time of great housing demand and short housing supply, the consumer of housing in a free society will have certain rights of choice. Just exactly what does the American consumer of houses want? There are probably 100,000 builders in the United States who believe they know exactly what he wants, they change their minds each year. There is also a handful of professional observers of this consumer, like the present writer, who will readily admit that they have not the slightest idea of what this consumer wants, and that, moreover, the average consumer does not have the slightest idea either. The only thing that we do know is that the average American consumer of practically anything is highly susceptible to a number of compelling influences, so the question we should ask is not what he wants, but in what manner his desires for the Prada house are being shaped today. In coming to grips with the problem of good overall community design, I believe we will, before long, be forced to give up the individual house altogether, except in those few cases where a wealthy client will still be able to afford the luxury of the obsolete. For there is no question in my mind at all, the house in America is becoming obsolete, and we may soon build museums to display the few remaining examples of the art, or set up reservations on which an occasional charming individual American house may be inspected by tourists and their children on Sundays between the hours of 10 and 4. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.